So hi, I'm Terry. Hopefully you can hear me. I can't tell if the mic's working or not because I'm trying to stand behind where the, my, the uh, speaker is. Um, this is my first time giving a talk in a really long time, and it's my first time giving a talk without having shopped it with my, my uh, research group a few times first. So please, if I'm speaking too fast, if I'm not loud enough, if you're just really confused, do feel free to interrupt me. I'm used to it. I'm an academic. People fight with us all the time. So the name of this talk comes from a quote that's uh, it's Linus Torvald's paraphrase by Eric Raymond, which is, Given enough eyeballs, all bugs are shallow. You've probably all heard this in the context of open source. The idea being that you open up your source, you let everyone look at it, people find things, they fix them, they make things awesome. And that's pretty cool. You also hear a very similar thing in terms of cryptography, where if you want to have a good cryptographic algorithm, you open it up, you let the whole community look at it and see if there's any flaws in your thinking, and hopefully you get something better as a result. So people combine these together and they say, well, we've got all these eyeballs in open source, therefore we're more secure. And sometimes, if you're lucky, that works, and sometimes it doesn't work so well. So why am I qualified to tell you about the glory of open source security? So I have a PhD in horribleness. I really do have a PhD. It is not actually in horribleness, but it's pretty close. It's in web security, which is... <laughs> So, so the great thing about choosing, choosing PhD topics is you go around until you find a project, a project and you say, this is really awful and completely unfixable. And your thesis supervisor goes, hmm, sounds like a thesis topic. <laughs> so some of you are laughing because you already know that web security is horrible, but some of you maybe don't know. Why is web security horrible? And web security is horrible for all the right reasons. Web security is horrible because the web was built to facilitate sharing. And as any of you have interacted with a small child or perhaps a cat knows, sharing can be a really good thing or a really bad thing. Sometimes sharing means toys and hugs, and sometimes sharing means slightly gnawed bagels and dead birds and <laughs> the horrible plague that the entire kindergarten class had. So web security facilitates all of these things. <laughs> In fact, I, 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 I should probably say, so, so in terms of what that means in the web, you build a web page by putting all these things into it, and sometimes they are smiles and rainbows, and sometimes they are horrible diseases. So obviously, we don't really want all the horrible diseases. So can we fix web security? So I wrote a whole thesis in this, and uh, my answer is um, maybe, I hope. The problem with a lot of the ways we fix web security is that they make everything kind of awkward and ugly and hard to use and really slow. And uh, if you saw me earlier with my bag, I'm getting on a plane shortly after this talk, so I, I have this in mind. There are many things that, where we try to provide security by making things awkward and slow. They aren't maybe as effective as we'd like. We're not really all that great at evaluating threats. We're not all that great at getting things right 100% of the time. And if you want things to be secure, you sort of do want to be right 100% of the time. So lesson number one, and I haven't even made it out of my intro of myself, but lesson number one about security is that getting security right is really hard, even for experts. And when I was working in web security, I spent a lot of time trying to convince people that the solution to everything was not to just hire an expert who would do everything right, because that's how we end up with things like the TSA. So it's a thing to keep in mind. So let me tell you a little story about why I left academia, because it's going to be relevant, really. I'm not just talking about these things. So I decided to leave academia Many years before I actually did leave academia, I was prepared. I was sitting in a conference much like this, the Ottawa Linux Symposium, which to me was a local conference. It attracted a whole bunch of open source luminaries. It was super cool. I was a young student. And I was in a talk on kernel parameter setting using a genetic algorithm. So I don't know if any of you are familiar with genetic al algorithms, but it's a 
cool way to you, you start with a sort of OK solution, and you try to mutate the heck out of it until you get a better solution. It's pretty old technology. Started maybe in the 50s. The, the, the versions we know today are mostly from the late 60s and 70s. And I'm sitting in this talk. And I thought, OK, well, this, is, this has been done, but it's, it's cool. I've never seen it done with, with kernel parameter settings. But when the question period started, all these people started going and asking questions that made it clear to me that they had never seen this before. And this was the most mind-blowing thing that they had ever seen. And fair enough, not everyone has the same academic background. But it made me think, if I'm going to do work in security, I can't stay in the ivory tower. It is worthless to anyone if the communities that I care about don't know about it. I'm going to stick a little di digression in here. Security and open source, academia and open source, go together really well. So let me tell you a little story. I, um, my most recent job was at the University of New Mexico with a professor named Stephanie Forrest. In the two years I was there, she won a huge number of like big awards for her work. And after one of these was announced, she sat us all down and said, I want you to know that I'm winning all these awards. And if you want to be the sort of people who are winning all these awards, you need to open source everything you're doing. Open source your data, open source your, your code, open, be, be open, be collaborative, because I would not have 30 bazillion citations and be so well known in the community without doing that. And so when I was thinking, well, if I want to care about security, what am I going to do? One of the answers for me was looking at open source already. Being part of that community, having those many eyeballs that would, that would both find out about my things and explain them to other people and make them better. So anyhow, long story short, I now work for Intel, Intel's Open Source Technology Center, which is totally awesome. Uh, this is the first time in, in forever that I've had to put up a uh, opinions expressed are my own and do not represent my employer, so I'm super excited about that. It turns out that uh, universities don't care if you talk on their behalf, but uh, companies are a little bit more cautious. It's very sane of them, really, given the sort of things that university people say. <laughs> so what I do for Intel is totally my dream job. I've only been there for six months. You can ask me again in two years and see if I'm just as happy about it. But I do security for open source and open standards. So they hired me to go and work with any of the open source projects that they think are interesting or that they contribute to and try to improve their security. And then on top of that, a portion of my job time is spent reading the W3 standards and trying to make sure that we don't make disastrous choices for security. Uh, if any of you have been following the HTML5 standards, some of them have been a little bit odd. And I had always thought, I wonder what these people are thinking and why they're not thinking about security. And then I discovered, oh wait, this is my job. I know exactly what they're thinking. They're thinking about completely different things. But it's my job to think about it, and I, sh I should be able to help. So. Let me tell you a story about my first W3C experience. This is the World Wide Web Consortium that designs the standards for HTML and stuff. If you're wondering what the heck that is, that's a storyteller statue from New Mexico. I, I'm afraid I can't remember what Pueblo the, the artist is from, but it's a big, big creature, lots of little, little ones. Tell a story. So that's why, it, why it's related to this. It has nothing to do with the W3C. So the first time I encountered the W3C in a up close and personal kind of way. I was working for a little startup that was doing some really cool mobile graphics stuff on phones. And back then, we did not have smartphones. So we were talking about really small screens, really low resources. And there were a lot of, lot of constraints that really mattered. So my company was hosting the, uh, an, this, this big meeting for one of the working groups. And there was another company there that was really pushing for a new mobile-oriented standard. Only this other company was really, really big. In fact, I would name them, but that seems rude. But they were really big, and they were very vested in doing, doing their cool thing on big desktop machines. 
And so they came to us and a whole bunch of other companies and said, hey, this is our draft standard. We'd like you to maybe look at it and maybe we could sign off on it and we're going to release it on Wednesday. And we looked at it and we said, oh my goodness, they have put in all these algorithms that are completely impossible to implement in the phones that we were using. They just, we had spent a whole lot of time prepping, prepping all these different devices to run this, this type of software. And in fact, we had this great demo, which was a literal bucket of devices. And we would just pull the phones out of it. And look, here it is on this thing. And look, here it is on this thing. It was really, really uh, visual, really, really, really good. And so we looked at the standard and thought, we can't sign off on this. What are we going to do? And so the answer was that we stayed up all night and we wrote our own standard. And we released it the day before the big company was supposed to release theirs. And um, we, we were kind of worried that we were going to be really in trouble, but the big company didn't say anything, actually, because they were overwhelmed by everyone going, oh my goodness, this little company with all these devices, they know everything about everything. We should totally glom on to their standard, and this is how it's going to work. And that's how we got into to, to the spec that is still continuing to this day. <laughs> I, I don't know if I want to say because it's kind of incriminating, but uh, if, if, if you look around, you might be able to figure it out from my resume. <laughs> so lesson number two is that standards and open source are very vulnerable to compelling demos and persistent people. <laughs> and um, I like to believe that my little startup was totally in the right. The, 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 those algorithms would have been too, too heavyweight. Having the simpler ones that didn't make circles quite as perfect was a better choice, at least as a fallback. And so sometimes that means we're, we're, we're working towards the greater good and it's all good. But sometimes the most compelling person, the, 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 the most noisy, the most charismatic, may not have your best security interests in mind. And often, a lot, when you're doing standards work, security is sort of down there on the list. There's committees that I work with at Intel where I am like number five on the list of reps. And it's my job to just be annoying. So, you can't trust that the people who are, who are, who are proposing things first are necessarily going to be the, the, the one you should go with. But uh, this is the thing that we're vulnerable to, not just in standards work, but in general. They, they call it the anchoring principle. So whatever you have first, everything you, you, choose there, you look at thereafter is sort of compared to that. So it's really bad in security, though. But what about all those eyes? Right? We're, we're, we're open, we're, we're, we're productive, we've got all these people looking at it, surely they will see that this is a terrible idea. And uh, as you can probably guess from my picture, I'm going to tell you a story about why these eyes are not solving all your problems solved by the, that may have been generated earlier. So let me tell you about web crypto. So this is, this is a, standards, the, a standard that the W3C is putting forward that sounds a little weird when you first hear it. They're trying to make it so that all these cryptographic primitives are available in JavaScript, which is kind of cool because it means people won't implement their own and do horrible, dangerous things, and kind of terrible because you're still doing cryptography in JavaScript and you're vulnerable to that oversharing problem that web pages have where maybe something else is going to be in there. So the story about web crypto is I joined just as the, at the end of their, we have made this standard, we're going to put it out. And the way the W3C works is you, you propose a standard, you argue about it for as long as it takes. Once the arguments have died down enough that you feel that, that as a committee you're ready to say, here, this is a thing, you go to last call and you have a varying amount of time, but in this case it was about eight weeks where the public is invited to come and comment on this. And so hopefully, once again, this is the many eyes theory, hopefully the, the public is going to, to see anything that you've missed or have, have ideas about how it should be used that maybe you didn't think of, so should be pretty cool. And so Web Crypto did, did their release. And then we waited, and we waited, and after two weeks, I was on the phone call with the Web Crypto team, 
And the chair said, so you may have noticed we haven't got a whole lot of comments. Um, this probably isn't a sign that the spec is really good. It's probably a sign that nobody's looking. Can you guys, like, I don't know, tweet about it or something? Yeah. So um, perhaps not, not the most effective thing. So lesson number three is that you can do all these things and someone's nobody cares. And of course, we all know the experience of nobody cares, but it's pretty scary when this is a standard that's going to stick around for years and years. And it's easy to say, well, well, OK, but web crypto, it's kind of a stupid standard. Maybe, maybe people just didn't like that one. But let me tell you about reasons that I have not looked at security. So I uh, am one of the core developers for GNU Mailman which is the mailing list software, which you may recognize because it looks like it was made in the 90s because our interface hadn't been updated since then. We, if, if, if you go to uh, Karen's talk about, uh, about the work she's doing on HyperKitty, you'll get to see how amazing it's going to be, but I digress. I don't look at security for Mailman, and I never have. And part of that is because Mailman is my thing to do when, it, when it's fun, and I don't want to spend all my time thinking about security. Sometimes you need to break. Another reason that was, that was really important to me was when I was a student, I knew I was working on this open source project, and I was going to need to find a job. And when I went to find a job, a lot of companies say, anything you do related to your job cannot be also in your open source projects. And so I was basically preparing myself so that I could claim, mailman has nothing to do with security. I, I just like do, do email stuff. That's, that's totally fine. It didn't work out so well for me because it turns out a lot of security companies have fingers in the email pie or, or really don't like that you've got an open contributor agreement with the Free Software Foundation and you're writing GPL3 code. So I actually turned down a lot of jobs because they said, yeah, so about that mailman thing and about that mentoring for summer of code thing. And so, so one of the reasons I took the job at Intel is when I asked them, so is it going to be a problem that I contribute to these projects? They said, oh, oh, well, we'll need a list. But it's just so we can figure out if we need to pay you for any of those. Anything you do in your own time is your own time. So yay, yay for working with, with open source people. That was pretty cool. The other reason that I hear, and uh, I certainly heard in the, the standard committee meetings, was uh, that security is hard. Remember point number one. And so I would hear things like, well, security is out of scope for this. So let's, let's not talk about that. We all know how well the security is out of scope. Let's just use OpenSSL thing worked for people. So, so I, 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 was, I was horrified. That was one of my early meetings. It turns out that it was out of scope because they wanted to discuss it later in the agenda, but I didn't know that. So, but certainly, if you were someone who, who uh, it, it's a thing that you do here on occasion. So let me continue my story about web crypto. So we like, I don't know, tweeted about it or something, told, told our colleagues, complained to Microsoft, and we finally got some comments. And we're like, this is awesome. There's like hundreds of comments coming in. Well, OK, maybe that's not so awesome, because now we have to deal with them. That's the other thing about the W3C is in the public comment phase, you have to, to resolve every single comment from the public. You don't have to agree with it. Sometimes you can say, this is out of scope, this is out of spec. But you have to actually make an answer. And the person has to be at least nominally happy with your answer. So we got all these things. And some of them were really good, actually. The, the uh, team from Microsoft went, and went through in great detail about the, the, the places where our, the algorithms' names were mismatched with another spec. And it was pretty awesome. But we also got a whole lot of, so my buddy who's a cryptographer says that SHA-1 is horrible and you should never, ever have it. And this was kind of awkward because SHA-1 is useful in some cases. And what if you need to verify a SHA-1 signature? And that's all you've got. It's still better than, than not having any verification in certain circumstances. And we got a lot of these, a lot, a lot of these. So. Lesson number four is that we may have many eyeballs. They're not necessarily helpful eyeballs. 
and they may think they are totally helpful eyeballs. This is a problem in, in uh, user interface design as well, as well as security, where you have false experts. And uh, if, if you ever catch yourself saying, well, my buddy who's a cryptographer said, that, that's totally cool. You, you should, it's worth bringing things up. But be prepared to then ha be told, no, this isn't, this isn't true because so is this and this and this. And if you want to defend your ideas, be prepared to cite actual cryptography papers. We're not going to take your word for it. So this wastes a lot of time of the Web Crypto Committee. And um, I'm actually very happy that I have found a colleague who is much more excited about Web Crypto than I am. So I don't have to answer all these questions because there's a lot of them. So, I guess the question that people really want to know is, does openness make us more secure? And the answer is, maybe. So all those extra eyeballs mean that we have a chance to find the person who's going to see the thing that is wrong. They may not be an expert. They, they, they may be an expert. We don't really know. And unfortunately, a scattershot approach is one way to do it. On the other hand, it wastes a lot of time, and so people aren't super comfortable with that. I personally think that open source can be a lot more secure because you have all these opportunities to, to fix mistakes, because you have a community of developers who are used to taking comments from the public, sometimes really angry comments from the public. That's actually great for security because it means we're used to dealing with it. We're used to responding to people. We're used to, to, to caring and not just dismissing people out of hand. So I think there's a lot of potential. But when we're thinking about how to make our projects more secure, we need to think a little bit about the sort of things that, we're, that, we're, that can trip us up. So getting security right is hard. You're going to have to invest some time into it or convince other people to invest their time. You have to remember that we're vulnerable to people who just are super charismatic. You have to remember that, that many eyes are no good if they're all closed or asleep and not interested. And many eyes is not super useful sometimes when people are angry or unhelpful or derailing. And so those are things that just as we have to do with, with other issues in our community, we have to be prepared to know how to dismiss those concerns Preferably in a way where everyone is happy, certainly the W3C model where everyone is supposed to come away with feeling like they have been taken seriously and their issue has been at least treated with respect, it's, it's pretty good. But you do have to remember that security isn't going to solve everything. So how can we do this? So this is my most wordy slide. One answer is that you can pay people like me. Yay! I, I like having a job. It's great. Other security people like having jobs, too. Um, so you can pay people to pay attention, to consistently pay attention. I, I did one job interview where they basically told me that as a security engineer for them, my job would be to social engineer other engineers into doing the right thing. And I thought that was really cool because usually people think I'm a little creepy when I talk about how important social engineering is for my job. But it really is important. I want to convince you that I'm right or at least understand your problems. But I want you to feel good about doing the security because often it's very out of your path. And I can't necessarily give you a monetary reward right now. It, it might just save you from disaster later on, and you're never really going to know. So one of the ways that we try to convince people to do security is to make, make them feel really good about doing security. Another thing you can do is, uh, so all those academics, you got lots of people who are into cryptography. They are paid to publish papers. They are not paid to spend hours poring over your web crypto spec. And so, Maybe money isn't going to be the best way to motivate those people. Maybe they already have tenure track jobs. Maybe they already have scholarships. Maybe they don't. Maybe money is totally the way to motivate them. But think about ways that you can fit into their workflow. So can, can, can you make it so that uh, they can get a paper out of their work with their project? 
can they put a nice little bullet point, if, if you're talking students, can they put a nice little bullet point on their resume that says, I'm a security consultant for this project? Is there anything else you can do? Like maybe, maybe you need a scholarship, maybe you need to, to have a paid contributor in this, this area. And there, there, there's the other thing that many, many companies do is bug bounties. So you find a bug, we give you money. This is, this is completely the opposite of the, the, the one where you encourage people to not be compelling and persistent, which is you find a bug and then we sue you. Don't do that. But it's really important to think about, you know, some, sometimes you need the stick, but try to think about ways to, to, to bring carrots to, to your security community. Even, even if you don't have money, even if you don't have, you know, amazing things you can be giving to people, Sometimes, you know, when, when I was a student, I was super excited when I got a sticker from the Free Software Foundation. That's what I got for signing my contributor agreement was a, a, a GNU sticker and a signed letter from, from Richard Stallman, which was really exciting because I didn't know him then. <laughs> and uh, so, so send, send people stickers. Invite people out to conferences. Give kudos on your website. Certainly that's something that the W3C, if you do a whole lot of work to help with a standard, often you'll be stuck in, stuck in the thank yous. But for an open source project, why not thank your bug contributors really vocally and repeatedly? Why not thank your volunteers? Why not say, wow, it is amazing that you read through all that stuff even though you didn't find anything. We really appreciate that you like fuzz tested our thing and threw as much garbage in there and we're really excited that we didn't fail and we're going to have a great blog post about how awesome we are and how awesome you are. So there's lots of ways that you can, you can encourage the security community to care about you and hopefully encourage your project to be a little bit more secure that don't involve just hiring people and maybe don't j just involve, well, you all need better developer training. Maybe it's true. Maybe, maybe, maybe that's a thing you can do. Maybe, maybe you can give people points for going and reading OWASP and understanding a little bit about web application security. But that shouldn't be our only answer. So I'm a little bit early, which means we have lots of times for questions and heckling. So, so, so yay. This is actually really good because I'm doing this terrible rock star thing where I like take my bag and get on a plane immediately after this talk. So, so I'm, uh, I'm really happy to talk up until about noon and then I have to leave. So uh, questions? <laughs> Oh, I don't know. I spent so much time trying to think of, of stories that weren't uh, incriminating? incriminating, making fun of people. Like the thing is, security is really, really hard, and it's really embarrassing to get wrong. I guess I, I can tell one a little bit about Mailman that uh, that is uh, pretty, yeah. pretty, pretty much uh, well known because it's in a textbook. So I've been working on Mailman for quite some time. And the guy who used to, to head everything up is a man named John Viega, who is also known for writing really excellent security textbooks. They're really fascinating. And so I'm reading through the security textbook, and he mentions Mailman, and I'm super excited. And what he's talking about is, again, this, this many eyes problem, and how long they went with a security bug that he should have known about. He's writing textbooks about these things, and he didn't catch it. And it was totally embarrassing, but it's a thing that happens, and it's a thing you have to be prepared for. So uh, if, if, if John Viega, who writes security textbooks and has like full tenure and everything, can totally make security mistakes and is willing to own up to it in those textbooks, we can all make security mistakes, and we, we, we should not be totally embarrassed about them. Just, just make it move on. <laughs> Any other questions? Well, 
Well, that marked the first time I have seen people crowdfund. So, so it wasn't for just for OpenSSL, but uh, for for some of the secure email stuff, where people were crowdfunding to hire security experts who could do audits, and that's really cool. That's that is something that. Uh, I had never seen done before. Usually you relied on companies like Intel and Mozilla and Google to provide security expertise for that sort of thing. So, so I'm really excited about that. I'm not completely convinced it's going to be a thing going forward for, for with, without big media disasters, but I'm pretty excited about it. The other thing is that I think it's been really interesting to sort of expose the fact that security critical things are still code. They're all still terrible code. They're all still old code. I know when, when, when I was working one of my uh, co-op terms, I worked on code that had been converted from B to C in some sort of machine translation. There was no way that was possibly like, logical. We had data structures where it was being converted from one thing to another, and it just happened to still work because nobody had changed the order of the parameters. And these, this was in huge data warehousing software. So like companies like Walmart or the US government were making decisions based on the data that we were returning. And uh, that's even scarier than security in some ways. So I think giving the, the, giving the public and the open source community an idea that, yes, these are projects you could help with. Yes, these are projects that have really low hanging bugs that need your help even though you're not an expert yet. Yes, you can become a security expert by you know, actually working at it. I think that's all really valuable shifts that we're, that we're starting to see because certainly I come from the ivory tower and people, people do tend to, well, you don't have a degree in it. You'll note that when I introduced myself, I did not say that I am Dr. Oda. I only use my degree when I want to intimidate my GSOC students into actually answering my emails. And, um, and mostly for making fun of myself. My, one of my coworkers calls me Dr. Oda only when it's funny in the meeting notes. So, so I'd say things like, oh, I'm, uh, this web crypto meeting was awful and I hate these people. And he would write up in the meeting notes, Dr. Oda says that web crypto is full of poo poo heads. And, <laughs> Yeah, so obviously that is not Intel's opinion, but you can have crappy meetings and they are way funnier if you say that Dr. Otis said that they were crappy meetings. <laughs> so I think moving away from, as Julie said in her keynote, killing your heroes, moving away, security people are human, security people are from all sorts of backgrounds, that's, that's pretty valuable. <laughs> <laughs> well, I just wouldn't say that's not true. The, the tools the Galois has, for example, would have needed patching when they were going back to work. So there are some things we can do. Yeah, again, the, we might have the tools but no eyes. But there were, there were definitely quite a few tools that did not catch it, and that's all patched now. So that was, that was really good. We've improved our security tools and our security. Yay! It's a win for everyone. Um, one of the things about security tools is they're really annoying to deploy. and. Like everything else in security, they were designed on the assumption that someone was going to be an expert and someone was going to work full time on making all these things work. So we have such an expert. In fact, we have several such experts at Intel. And so when I want to run an automated scan on a, on a product I'm working with, I go and ask them. But uh, if I, if I were, had been doing this a year ago, I wouldn't have known who to ask. So the tools are super valuable and super awesome but they do suffer from some of the same problems that we see elsewhere. A big problem that I didn't, in my opinion, I hear you talk about, um, because the open source community historically has such a lack of explicit requirements to develop the specification and explicit design, um, eyeball aren't as helpful because what am I looking for? Yeah. You know, I don't know what it's supposed to do or how it's supposed to work. Well, OK, it probably works like that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. and and. That, that, that is a big deal. Test cases can make your eyeballs a lot more helpful. Requirements can make your eyeballs a lot more helpful. 
some idea of how your software actually works can make your eyeballs more helpful. In the, case of, in the case of the W3C, one thing that would make the eyeballs way more helpful is if people actually knew how the W3C worked. We got a lot of people on web crypto saying, well, all these algorithms aren't secure. You need a list of algorithms that aren't secure, and you need to put this at the front of the document. And if, if I were an open source project doing this, that would be awesome. I'd just put it on the wiki. It'd be right there. We could keep it updated. But in the case of the W3C, they released their candidate recommendation, and it's expected to last for years. And they didn't want to put a, these algorithms are secure, either explicitly or implied by the list of insecure algorithms, because it probably wasn't going to be true while the document was out. So there, there's a lot of ways we can, we can work to make our eyeballs more helpful. <laughs> So the, obviously my expertise is in web security. And one of my favorite projects is the WebGoat project, where you go, they, they give you a little like broken web server thing, like web application, and then a bunch of assignments for how to poke at it and see how it's broken and, and do exploits on it. You run it on your local machine, so you're not breaking any laws, depending on which country you're in. I, I have to say that's, that's one of the things I really appreciate about working with Intel is that I now have this giant company and business cards that say that I'm an open source security person. So when I report bugs, nobody tries to arrest me. So uh, learn, learn, learning to do this in, in a nice, your own, your own private environment is super awesome. There are, depending on, uh, so web security is pretty open. So there's, there's a whole bunch of, tools and documents. I really love the WebGoat tutorials, but they're not the only ones. There's, there's all kinds of other ones as well. And I don't know if that's as true for other areas of, of security. I know cryptography is still pretty ivory tower. Um, one of my favorite things to look at is the usable security stuff. And if you have, if you have a little bit of time to read papers, so academic papers have this reputation for being super boring and awful, and they earn it. But uh, usable security people tend to uh, have more usable papers. So you might want to look into some, some of those if, if you're curious about the sort of issues. Uh, I worked with a group that was doing some authentication issues and was doing papers on, you know, the little, the little lock at the top of your, your bar when, when they wanted to look at the extended verification certificates, which would make it possible for you to get extra information. They, they worked with Mozilla to do a whole bunch of tests and eye tracking. What they learned is that people don't look at the lock, but if you put one on the page, they really look at that. And people don't look at the green, and people don't, look, people don't click on things. And so it was super depressing. But we learned a lot about how people actually use and perceive these things. So I, I find those some of the most fascinating things if you want to get excited about security and, and have some sense of uh, things that are super cool that, uh, that you can read. So the one I'm working with mostly right now is a project called Crosswalk, which is uh, basically you take Blink WebKit, the, the rendering engine, and you add all kinds of cool things to it so that you can make HTML5 games that use your accelerometer, even though normally the sandbox would not allow you to do that, and, may, and access your GPS and, and do a whole bunch of things that are much more native-like. It's, it's, it's totally awesome, and if you'll, you'll forgive me the plug for Intel, we have this, this XDK toolkit for developing HTML5 apps, which is like the most mind-blowing, amazing thing I had, I had ever seen when I first saw it, right after I started. So you can build, build your apps, compile it with this. It's super fast. However, as you might guess, taking your, your web thing and poking holes into your sandbox so you can reach into the guts of your, your mobile device. Or in, in fact, we do a lot of work with cars. So you can reach into your, your, your gas mileage data and stuff. Yet maybe not the most security conscious thing you can do. So it, it, it's, it, it's, uh, it's super interesting what, uh, what security issues there are and what we can and can't do to make that both totally awesome and reasonably secure. So the one, there, there's so many. 
But the, the one that I think I can say without, without incriminating in any groups inside of Intel was we had a call with a, with a external person who, um, who worked for a large cellular network. And we were sort of doing that, let's, let's feel like, are you a marketing person? Are you a security person? Are you a developer? We're doing, doing that butt sniffing phase of, of meetings with external people. This is why Intel does not own my opinions. Um, so in this butt sniffing phase, the guy asked, so I need to know, are you guys the sort of people who believe that you are going to have a car computer that is completely, completely and utterly walled off from your entertainment system? And, and, and everyone in the meeting went, well, um, and he just started laughing. So if you have always believed that your car is going to be controlled by a separate system than the one that talks to your iPod, it's a lie. And everyone knows it's a lie. And there's reasons. Really, there's reasons. You, you want your entertainment system to be able to display your odometer and your gas mileage and cool things and you know, warn you if your tire pressure is going and stuff. And so you need to be able to communicate the data. But the end result is that uh, they're, they're not really that separate. And maybe they will be. Maybe we'll find awesome ways to, to transmit all this data without ever accidentally transmitting something the wrong way. And I hope so. Certainly, I'm working with people to, to make sure that that's true. But uh, yeah, be afraid. <laughs> On the other hand, if you want to break into your car through using an iPod, it's going to be awesome. <laughs> and uh, if you've not seen the demos from the, from the guys who, who did the uh, unlocking your car using the tire pressure sensors, I highly recommend going and watching those, or the ones who discovered that you could replace any instruction with any other instruction. So they have a great video of some poor grad student driving down a, a nice empty uh, airplane runway. And uh, they're like, OK. Go, hit the brakes, and he hits the brakes, and the windshield wipers come on. <laughs> and the answer was, you couldn't actually just remove it so nothing happened. And for the purpose of the demo, we want something interesting to happen. So they turn the windshield wipers on. And then the student is starting to sound increasingly nervous as he's going down the highway. And they're like, OK, we're going to reboot the computer, and it's going to go back to normal. Now, he hits the brakes, and they stop. And there's no evidence in the machine that the car was ever tampered with. So if you want to assassinate people, cars, they're awesome. <laughs> yeah, so, so uh, that, that one with the windshield wipers was uh, uh, IEEE security and privacy. And I think they have videos online. If, if not, I think, I think the students themselves have, uh, have, have the videos up. The, the funny thing is that they said that the hardest part of this was not the amount of time it took to figure out which instruction to overwrite. The hardest part of this was getting their grad funding to pay for a car, because uh, it turns out that, that uh, grad funding is generally set up so that you cannot buy cars and stuff <laughs> with it. <laughs> so, so that was pretty funny. And then, of course, they had to like cover all the labels in the car so you couldn't tell unless you knew anything about cars which one it was. It was, it was pretty fun. We had, I had a really great dinner with those guys afterwards. <laughs> so I think I'm almost over time. So thank you all very much.